Well, in 2005, Manny Pacquiao had a match against the Mexican boxing legend, Eric Morales. And this was a fight for the World Featherweight Boxing Champion title. And Manny Pacquiao, if you don't know anything about him, he's a really small dude. But he often used this to his advantage because he was quick and he had this incredible speed and he had these powerful punches that so often could overpower his opponents. But not on that night. On that night, after a long, close-fought match, Morales emerged victorious, keeping his title. But this didn't stop Manny. In fact, what he started doing after this was he left that night and he went back right to training. And so he took his coach and they started training meticulously and vigorously. And so they studied all of Morales' weaknesses and they started capitalizing on Manny's strengths. And what would happen is a year later, they actually had a rematch. Only this time in 2006, Manny Pacquiao would defeat Eric Morales with a vicious left hook in the 10th round of the fight. And just like that, he became the featherweight world champion boxer. But it didn't last very long. So he ended up letting winning go, to, winning go to his head. And so he dropped his old coach in favor of someone new. And because he had won, he started getting a little lax in his training, feeling like he didn't have to tr train as hard and prepare as hard. And then he started getting uh, distracted with things like politics and all these different things. And what would end up happening is that Pacquiao would face several losses in his career as a result. And so after a few years of doing this, he kind of comes to his senses and he decides, I can't do it this way. I've got to go back to doing what I was doing. And so he reaches out to his old coach. He starts training with him again, and the rest is history. Manny Pacquiao, from that point forward, he devotes his life to boxing, and he goes on to win multiple world titles and eventually cement himself as the number six pound-for-pound -pound boxer in the history of boxing. See, there's no doubt that Manny Pacquiao was a winner. But what he had to learn to do early on in life was to not waste the wins. That in his moments of great success, he had to capitalize on and use his wins as opportunities to continue to grow and move forward. And we're continuing our sermon series, Wanderers, this week. And if you didn't join us last week, what we're doing is we're taking six weeks to walk through Israel's story, their journey from Egypt to Canaan, the promised land. And this morning, we're gonna take a look at the story of the manna and quail. And here's the main focus I wanna, or the main idea I wanna focus on this morning is don't waste the wins. And as we talk through our story today, I'm gonna have three practical truths for you that I think will help you do that. And so if you have your Bibles or Bible apps, you can go ahead and open those up to Exodus 16. That's where we're gonna be this morning. Now, all throughout Israel's journey, they experience wins. They experience these big moments of victory and triumph all along this journey. But so often, they waste these moments by responding with worry and disobedience. And as we get ready to pick up in our story, Israel, they're riding high off a big win because they've just been delivered from the hands of Egypt. And so last week, Sean taught on this, that in Exodus 14, as Israel is making their way out of Egypt, Pharaoh makes a last minute attempt to recapture and enslave Israel. But God, who has already displayed his unmatched might through the 10, the 10 plagues, decides to display it again. And so he leads Israel through the Red Sea by parting it. And as Egypt comes in for the attack, he sweeps away the armies into water. And so as we pick up in our story today, when we get to Exodus 16, Israel is celebrating, they're praising God for this win. And so everything's going great as they make their journey towards Canaan. But then problems arise. And that's where we pick up in verses one through three this morning. So if you would read with me. It says, the whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after they'd come out of Egypt. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the Israelites said to them, if we had only died by the Lord's hand in Egypt, there we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. So right off the bat, as we begin this story, Israel isn't just complaining against God. Scripture says they're grumbling. And what this was was an aggressive, angry complaint at God. So they're angry towards God for not giving them food. And if you're reading this for the first time, you might be thinking, well, they're, they're probably justified in that, right? I mean, this is a long journey. They're in the wilderness. And you may be thinking, well, if I ran out of food in the desert, 
I'd probably be pretty upset too. But it's not that simple. First, you need to understand this isn't even a long journey yet. At this point in scripture, Israel has been walking towards Canaan for one month. They haven't even come close to actually running out of food yet. And more than any of that, they just spent a week in a place called Elam. And in Exodus 15, it's described as a place that is filled with, and I quote, pools and palm trees. So they've had this really awesome month. God led them out of Egypt. They've had a vacation. They've still got food. They have everything they need. But this little inconvenience, man, it ruins everything for them. See, this is kind of the equivalent of living in Houston and taking a trip to Hawaii for a week. But this isn't just any ordinary trip to Hawaii, okay? You couldn't normally afford this, but you scrounged and you saved every single penny. And so you get ready to take this trip, you've got just enough money to travel and lodge yourself. But food, you're pushing it. And so the only money you have is enough money to eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches all week. But you're eating PB&Js in paradise. Not bad, right? Problem is, is that back in Houston, you ate like a king. I'm talking Lupe tortillas was your domain. And those fajitas... They're calling your name. The problem with Houston, though, right, is every time you step outside, you feel like you're steaming yourself from the inside out. So it can have all the great food in the world, not always the best place to be in the summer. And so you get to Hawaii, and you've got these beautiful views. You've got the beaches. You've got the mountains. You've got the volcanoes and the palm trees, everything you need. It's paradise. But that PB&J, it's rough. And so you're fine at the moment. But after a couple of days of eating that, you're tired of it. And so you think to yourself, you know what? I'd rather be in hot, sticky Houston with my 100 degree temperatures and 88% humidity because at least there I had steak. Doesn't make sense, does it? Because that's not how we respond to things normally. But Israel, this is exactly where they find themselves at this point in the story. Remember that they've just watched God's power on full display in Egypt. They've been delivered out of the hands of the people that enslaved them. God has been protecting them. They have food. They've been on vacation. They have everything they need in this moment. But as soon as complications arise, as soon as a problem comes up, they make this outlandish claim towards God. They say, we'd rather be in slavery because at least the food was good. And so they start to make this ridiculous claim of starvation towards God, that when life gets hard, they panic. But this isn't a characteristic that's unique to just Israel. The reality is, is this is something that we do all the time, that so often we take the problems in our life and we focus on them so much that they overshadow the winds, all the good that God has done in our life. And so this is why I want to give you our first practical truth this morning. Look for wins in the losses. See, Israel wasted their win. They took the molehills of subpar food and slightly harsh conditions, and they magnify it into the mountain of starvation, that they take everything that God had done for them, and they just forget about it because they're so focused on the problems in front of them. But man, this is the exact opposite of how we should respond in these situations. That in the moments where life is tough, in the moments where we feel like we're faced with losses, these are the moments where we should focus even harder on the wins in our life, to focus on the ways that God has provided. Because the reality is, is that even in the hard moments of life, there are wins to be found. You know, maybe you've got a job that you do not like. You come home every day, you're stressed, you're aggravated, and you're ready to quit. But you need to remind yourself that it's a job that God provided you, and it pays the bills and keeps a roof over your head. Parents in the room, when your kids are disobedient and you've told them to do the same thing over and over and over again, and they just won't do it, remind yourself that children are a blessing not many people get to have. Husbands in the room, when your wife asks you to take the trash out for the eighth time in a row that day, remind yourselves that you actually found somebody who wanted to marry you, and that in and of itself is a miracle. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So you got, uh, the ladies are clapping. Uh, but in all seriousness, here's the deal, is you can't 
let the losses in life, the problems, overshadow all the wins. That when life gets hard, you need to take this as an opportunity to focus on the good things, to find the wins in the losses. Because I promise you, if you look for them hard enough, they're there. So, what can you do in these moments? Well, first, I would encourage you and challenge you, write down the wins in your life. So in the moments where life gets hard, in the moments where you feel like you're fighting a losing battle, this is a great opportunity for you to write down the ways that God has blessed you in your life and just read over them. And, and this alone actually has benefits. In 2003, there was a study done by the researchers Emmons and McCullough, and what they found is that if you will write down, and I quote, the blessings and benefits of your life, if you list them out and look over them, that psychologically this has an incredible benefit to you, that it does two main things, that it greatly improves your happiness and your joy, but it also changes and improves your outlook on life. But more than just psychological benefits, there's spiritual benefits with this as well. And so along with listing these things out, what I would encourage you to do is to think over these things and pray and thank God continually for them because it changes things for you. Look what Paul said in Philippians 4, 4 through 7. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all for the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So when we take the time to reflect on who God is and what God has done for us, and when we praise him for this, Scripture actually tells us that the peace of God comes into your life and it guards your hearts and your minds. And this is just a beautiful way of saying that when we do this, when we thank God in all circumstances, that he protects us. But more than just that, he also changes our perspectives on the problems in our lives. And see, I think this is something that Israel so often misses throughout their story that when they're faced with problems, all they're focused on is their problems. And so, so often they forget to remember what God did for them. And so I wanna challenge you don't make the same mistake that Israel did. That when you're faced with the losses in your life, look for the wins because they're there. And so what I would encourage you to do is to remind yourself of the blessings that God has for you and give him thanks in all circumstances. And if we do this, God will protect you, he'll give you peace, and he'll walk with you through the hard moments in your life. All right, well, let's look at our next verses. This is starting with verse six. It says, so Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, in the evening, you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning, you will see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we that you should grumble against us? But Moses also said, you will know that it is the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You're not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses told Aaron, say to the entire Israelite community, come before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. And while Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked toward the desert, and there was the glory of the Lord appearing to the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard your grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread, and then you will know that I'm the Lord your God. And so that evening quail came and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. And when the dew was gone... Thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. And when the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, well, what is it? For they didn't know what it was. And Moses said to them, it is the bread the Lord has given you to eat, that this is what the Lord has commanded. Everyone is to gather as much as they need. So take an omer for each person you have in your tent. So despite Israel's anger and doubts towards God, God remains faithful. And so what he does here is he promises to Israel that he will reveal his glory and he will provide for them food to eat. And so what he says is that in the evenings, they will have quail that land at their camp. And in the mornings, they will collect a flaky substance, this bread-like substance from heaven. And so quail, if you didn't know this, is actually was considered a delicacy in Egypt. And so Israel would have been very excited to eat this meat. This would have been the equivalent of them getting a couple of Michelin star meals thrown in every now and then. But then you got this whole bread situation. I didn't really know what it was. It was this flaky substance that they couldn't really describe. And so the only thing they could say about it was, what is it? And so that's what they named it. Manna translates to, what is it? And 
They would gather it like wheat, and really the only description that we have of manna is we know that it tasted kind of sweet, almost as if you would mix some honey into it. And one of the things that I think is so interesting about this story and God's provision here is God's methods of provision. Because I think about the fact that God could have provided for Israel in any kind of way and any kind of thing he wanted to. But I think he does two important things here. The first one is manna, it falls from heaven like the dew. And then the second thing I think is that God, he requires Israel to gather the food instead of giving it to them. Now, both of these things lend to the principle of contentment, that Israel had to learn that God was going to provide in his way, but they also had to learn that whatever way God provided was good, that it was a win. See, Israel may not have loved that they had to gather their food, and they may not have loved they had to eat the same thing every single day, but God kept his promise and took care of his people. He provided for them, and he did it in a way that was good to them and good for them. And so even in the moments where they didn't understand it, they had to learn to be content with the life that God had given them. And this is the same principle that we have to follow as well. This is a concept that we has to, have to grasp just as much as Israel. And so this leads us to our second truth, and I'm gonna give it to you in two parts. So here's the first part, be content. We have to learn to be content with the circumstances of life. We have to learn to be thankful and grateful for the life that God has provided for us. And so when we do this, this contentment, it's not really about us being okay with our circumstances, but really it's about this idea of focusing on the one who provides for us. Because if we can understand who it is who provides for us, all the circumstances in our life, they don't really matter as much when we know who's in control. And Paul talks about this in Philippians 4, 12 through 13. He says, look, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. That I've learned the secret of being content in an, any and every situ situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, that I can do all of this through him who gives me strength. See, the secret to contentment is not a change in circumstance. It's a shift in perspective that when we focus on God and we recognize and realize that it's this loving, powerful God who is the one who provides for us, then we can know that his provision is good because he's good. And when we understand that that's the God who provides for us, we can trust in that provision no matter what it looks like. And so for Israel, they had to learn to remind themselves of the ways that God had provided for them. They had to understand just who it was that they served and who was taking care of them. And so for you, my challenge to you with this is remind yourself who God is. Remind yourself of who it is that provides for you. That just like Israel, God commanded them that they needed to remember who it was who led them out of the Red Sea. And it's the same thing for us that we need to constantly remind ourselves who it is that provides for us. And so the best way that we can do that is for us to think about the ways that God provides for us. So I would encourage you to think about the situations in your life that are like the manna. Those moments where you don't understand what's going on, you don't really know what's happening, but when you look back at it, you can see the ways that God carried you through it day by day anyway. But I would also encourage you to remember the moments like the quail, these moments where God immensely blesses you in ways that you don't deserve and in ways that you can't comprehend. But in all of this, what we do is we remember who God is we remember what he does, that we remember his power, his goodness, and his faithfulness in all the ways that he's provided for us. And we let those lead us to contentment in all circumstances. Now, contentment is only half the challenge because here's the reality, is that contentment was never supposed to lead us to a point where we're so satisfied with how our life is that it causes us to become stagnant. And so this leads us to the second half of our second truth, which is be content but not complacent. That if we want to not waste our wins, you have to learn to use them as opportunities to grow. So look at what us in the, uh, our next verses. This is verses 17 and 18. It says, the Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much, some little. And when they measured it by the omer, the one who gathered much did not have too much. And the one who gathered little did not have too little. 
everyone gathered just as much as they needed. So this is a great moment for Israel, right? Another victory, another win right here because the journey gets to continue. They've got the supplies they need because now God is providing. But what's interesting here is there's a little catch to it is that God actually gives them specific instructions of how they are to gather the manna and the quail. And in the verses before this, he actually says that he specifically does this to test Israel. That this is supposed to be a moment for Israel to learn to grow in their faith and their dependence on God. And so this should be a moment when we look at this story, it should be a moment where we see this beautiful relationship formed between God and his people. That's not really what happens. Look at the next couple of verses with me. Then Moses said to them, no one is to keep any of it till morning. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses and they kept part of it till morning, but it was full of maggots and began to smell. So Moses was angry with them. So this is supposed to be this good moment, right? It's an opportunity for them to grow and God gives them simple instructions here. He says, look, take as much as you need, nothing else. And if you have anything left over, throw it out. Because if you don't, it's gonna rot. Easy, easy instructions. But I love how specific scripture gets here. That it says that some of the Israelites paid no attention to Moses. They just straight up ignored him. Because when life got good and things started going Israel's way again, they just did whatever they wanted. And we see that again in a couple of verses later that God also commands them on the sixth day, they're supposed to gather twice as much because the seventh day was the Sabbath. You didn't work on the Sabbath. And so they were not allowed to gather. And so God made them a promise. He said, look, if you don't do that and you get up on the seventh day and you go look for stuff, you're not gonna find anything. And so naturally, some people did the right thing. They'd got twice as much. But then you had these other people who went out on the seventh mornings, they didn't gather and nothing was there. And this is how God responds to him in verse 28. He says, how long will you refuse to keep my commands and my instructions? See, it was a golden opportunity for Israel to grow. They had nothing going against them at this point. It's a perfect opportunity to be able to build their obedience and dependence on God. But when things started going their way, they got lazy and complacent. And this led them to disobedience. And that disobedience led them right back into the same situation of hunger that God had been working to get them out of. And maybe some of you have been in a similar situation to the Israelites. Now maybe you've not been hungry in a desert, but maybe you've come to church before because you're desperate for change. And so you show up and you have this great experience with God and you make a decision right there. Like, this is it. This is the moment that I'm gonna be serious and committed about my faith. And you do it. I'm talking, you're in church every single week. You are praying, you're reading your Bible, you're changing life habits, you're removing sin and growing in all the ways that you were supposed to. But then when the problems in your life start to get better, the complacency starts to kick back in. And then when life gets good, there's a laziness that develops that slowly leads to disobedience. And over time, what happens is that all these things that you've worked to remove in your life, all the sin that, you brought out, that you're out of and all the situations that God's walked you through, you go right back to them. Listen, don't waste your wins. At these moments where God is working in your life, when you're watching God remove the sin in your life, when he's changing you from the inside and out, these are not the moments for you to get lax in your commitment to faith. These are the moments where you're supposed to step up and grow deeper in your faith to grow in your obedience to God because it's an opportunity that he's given you. And so my challenge to you this morning with this is that if this is something you struggle with, be consistent. Yes, read your Bible. Yes, pray. Show up to church. Work to remove the sin in your life and to be obedient to God. But when things start going the right way, don't stop. This is an opportunity that when God is working in your life, you get to grow even more and more. And so if you'll be consistent in that, if you'll continue to work in your life, what you'll watch happen is that you get to grow without hindrance that there's nothing holding you back, that it's just you and God. And you can grow in ways that you didn't even know were possible for you. 
So be content, but don't be complacent. Look to God for peace in your circumstances, but use those circumstances as opportunities to move forward and grow in your life and your faith. And if you'll do that, I think you'll be blown away by what you'll watch God do in your life. All right, well, look at me uh, with me in our last verses today. This is starting in verse 32. It says, Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Take an omer of manna and keep it for the generations to come so they can see the bread I gave you to eat in the wilderness when I brought you out of Egypt. So Moses said to Aaron, take a jar and put an omer of manna in it, then place it before the Lord to be kept for generations to come. As the Lord commanded Moses, Aaron put the manna with the tablets of the covenant law so that it might be preserved. So God gives Israel a command. He says, take an omer, which is a jar's worth, of manna, and he says, set it aside so that future generations can look at it. Now, the point behind this ultimately is that they would remember what God did. And the omer is actually kind of a precursor of sorts to the tithe. Now, they're different, right? Because the omer of manna is not the same thing as tithing of money, but they ultimately have the same goal, that God is glorified. And so for the omer, you need to think about it like the Super Bowl trophy in the case. That when you look at that, you know where the victory came from, you know who won the battle. And so for Israel, they take this omer, they do what God says, and it's a specific way to remember a specific way that God provided for them. And so this isn't the only time this happens throughout their history. When you look through the Old Testament, you'll see plenty of examples where monuments are erected, or temples are, rena- are dedicated, and land is renamed. And all of these are these situations and moments where Israel wants to make sure that they never forget how God worked in their lives. And this leads us to our last practical truth. Mark your moments. Israel wanted to make sure that they never forgot what God did for them in the wilderness. And this is the same thing that we need to do. We need to learn to mark our moments, that we would remember all the ways that God has provided for you. And so I would challenge you to find ways to mark your moments, find ways to remember what God has done in your life. And this is not the same as what we talked about earlier when I told you you should write down some blessings. These are specific ways that you can remember the moments where God has drastically changed the trajectory of your life. Now, one of the biggest ways that we do this today is baptism, that we're saved by grace through faith in Jesus, and when we repent and follow him, that's salvation. But we mark that moment of salvation with baptism, that it's the symbol of going under the water and coming back up, that we're symbolizing and showing that we have gone from death to ourself to life in Christ. And it's this beautiful and important step of obedience that we take to remember that. And I would encourage you, if that's something you've never done, if you've never marked your moment of salvation with baptism, I would love to talk to you about what that looks like. In just a few minutes, I'll be in the back of the room. Come talk to me and we can talk through that. But marking your moments, it's not just about baptism. There's plenty of ways that you can remember what God's done for you. And I wanna give you just a couple of examples for that. One way I would say is to journal. Every single day, just write down the ways that God's working in your life that day. And in and of itself, those little journal entries, they're not that big of a deal, but what you end up with over time is you have this whole book that becomes this overarching picture of what you looked like at the beginning and what you look like at the end, and it's a beautiful reminder of how God has changed your life. But I would also encourage you, share your testimony, share the story of how God has changed your life. Because when you share our testimony and you talk to people about this, you're doing a couple of things. One, you're glorifying God in that process and you're sharing the gospel. But you're also reminding yourself constantly of the life that God has given you through Jesus. Now, there's another example I'm gonna give you. This one can be silly. Sometimes it's big monumental things for people. Sometimes they're small. But occasionally there are actual items that you can hold on to in your life that may help you remember things. Uh, For me, I have a really silly one. It is a little Chick-fil-A cow. It's a little stuffed cow. Just has, and it's got a little wooden sign hanging over. It says, eat more chicken. And I used to put that on the monitor of my computer and it sat there for about three years. And now I just keep it in storage so I can hold on to it. And anytime anyone would see it, they would laugh at me and make fun of me for it. But that little cow, it was a reminder for me that it reminded me of the friendships that I had in Georgia. It was given to me by a close friend at my last church. And every time I looked at that cow, it reminded me of these incredible, impactful friendships that God gave me. These were friendships that changed who I was as a pastor, 
but they also helped me walk through some really hard moments in life and in ministry, and I never wanted to forget that. So these are just a couple of examples, but whatever it is for you, mark your moments. But take time to remember the ways that God has drastically changed your life. Remember the ways he has shown you his goodness and his faithfulness, and let these serve as a reminder to strengthen you and encourage you in life and faith. You know, when I was a sophomore in high school, I played football. I know that may shock some of you, but the other sports didn't really suit me too well. And I remember getting into high school football and being so excited about this, right? It's like the first season on varsity. And I gotta tell y'all, we were horrible. I mean, absolutely horrible. Now we had some talent on the team, but we just never really seemed to get things rolling. And I remember that first season, we won a whopping one game. But I'll tell you something, I will never forget that one win. First week of the season, we got beaten handily by a team called Manchester Academy. They were these country boys up in the Mississippi Delta and they beat the brakes off us by over 30 points. And I remember leaving that game, we were, we were you know, just hopeless, we were distraught. We were thinking, well, there goes the season, right? But we made a choice, we said, okay, you know what? Let's just, let's just pick back up, we got some good stuff going for us, our running game's working all right, and so we've got Adams County Christian coming up. And you know what? We've watched the film, maybe they're a team we can beat. And so we go, and we practice, and we practice, and we practice, and we practice, and then it comes game time on Friday. And we feel like we're ready. And y'all, we went out, and we dominated. We beat the mess out of that team. The score didn't show it, it was 24 to six. But what you didn't know is that our running back ran for over 400 yards. I mean, they just couldn't stop us. And I will never forget the feeling of that buzzer going off on the scoreboard. This rush of adrenaline coming over us as we won the first game in our schools in three years at our school. People rushed the field and we're sitting there, we're celebrating this win. And then something absolutely ridiculous happens. We had this crazy coach. He was our assistant coach and he was my lineman coach. And all of a sudden he gets up in front of everyone and he starts dancing and singing the song, Father Abraham. Y'all know it, Father Abraham had many sons. And many sons said, Father Abraham, I am one of them. There we go, there you go, see y'all know it. And so we're sitting here, we're celebrating this football win and there's this man just sitting here marching around and couldn't tell you why we did it, but all of a sudden we joined in. And so what I remember is I remember having my arms around my teammates. We're sitting there with all the cheerleaders, all the band members, all the, the parents and fans in the stands now out on this field. And we are dancing and singing in circles, marking our victory with Father Abraham. And I got to tell you something. It's a moment that I will never forget. There's something about that that has stuck with me all these years. I was, tw I was 15 years old, I'm 27 now. So I've, I remember that for 12 years, I'm gonna remember it for the rest of my life. And now every time I hear that song or even hear people mention Abraham, all I think about is that one coach marching his way up and down that field. See, the wins in your life, they're special. Whether it's something small, like winning a game under Friday Night Lights, or it's something monumentally huge like life change that we find through Jesus in the gospel. Your wins are powerful. So don't waste them. Find wins in the losses. Remind yourself constantly of how God has provided for you. Be content in circumstances, continually grow. And find ways to mark the moments and remember the big changes in your life that God has given you. And if you'll do that, it'll change everything about you and your life. So the question this morning is, will you do it? Will you use the wins in your life as an opportunity to learn and grow in your life and faith? Or will you waste the wins? Let's pray.